South Hill is having a cleanup day on the 22nd from 9 to noon. If you're interested in helping out with that, uh, please get in touch with uh, Lois Finch. I think some of the YC kids are also helping out with that as well. Um, so if you're able to help out with, with any of those cleanup events, uh, please let us know as soon as possible. Light the Night's next event is April 27th uh, from 6 to 9 at New Hope. Uh, Billy Callahan is going to be leading that up, so it, the theme is it's personal. So I guess you have to find out there what makes it so personal. So uh, be there for that. And then also the Concord Baptist Association is having their disaster response training on April 29th. Uh, it is a totally free event, and so you can do uh, all sorts of trainings to help prepare for uh, impact this summer or if any future disasters that may uh, hopefully, Lord willing, not come to us, but, you know, somewhere else, I guess. So uh, if you're interested in that, register as soon as possible. It is a totally free event, um, so make sure you uh, get involved with that. Sunday, May 7th is our next child dedication, so if you have a child that you would like dedicated, uh, please let me or Pastor Wayne know by April 30th. And then uh, YC is doing a senior adult appreciation lunch uh, Saturday, May 13th at noon. Uh, you can uh, RSVP to me, or uh, you can uh, sign up on the church app for that. Uh, please do that by May 7th, so we know how much food to prepare. So uh, I, we'll probably have either some games or maybe watch a movie or something uh, in the fellowship hall, but just let us know as soon as possible, um, because we want to be able to give back to you all as well. There is also a one-day marriage uh, retreat at Olive Branch on Saturday, June 10th from 9 to 3. Uh, Paul and Wanda Bailey are going to be moderating it, and uh, please register by May 21st, and the cost is only $20 per couple. So uh, it is limited to 30 couples, so please, if you are, uh, you know, a couple, uh, do it as soon as possible. I mean, I guess you could go if, if, if you're single, but, um, you know, I don't know how practical it would be. So uh, please let, uh, or sign up at the Welcome Center or on the app as soon as possible. Um, other than that, we're going to go into our prelude.
song reminds us that our Lord Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And we are here this morning to praise Him and to worship Him. So welcome your neighbor this morning with a handshake, a hug, a smile. I welcome you this morning to Olive Branch Baptist Church. Our Redeemer, our Lord Jesus Christ, is risen. And last Sunday was the day we celebrated each year Jesus' resurrection. But of course, every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. This is why we worship on the first day of the week. Because it was on the first day of the week that the women went to the tomb and found it empty. And so the resurrection is celebrated every day. And so I'm glad that you are here today to celebrate that resurrection. Part of our life is giving thanks to God for his redemption for the life he gives. And so I want to read Psalm 138. It's a psalm of David. And in this song, he sings his thankfulness to God. Psalm 138. I will give you thanks with all my heart. I will sing your praise before the heavenly beings. I will bow down before you in your holy temple and give thanks to your name. For your constant love and truth. You have exalted your name and your promise above everything else. On the day I called, you answered me. You increased strength within me. All the kings on earth will give thanks, Lord. They will give thanks to you when they hear what you have promised. They will sing of the Lord's ways. For the Lord's glory is great. Though the Lord is exalted, he takes note of the humble. But he knows the proud from a distance. If I walk into the thick of danger, you will preserve my life from the anger of my enemies. You will extend your hand and your right hand will save me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Lord, your faithful love endures forever. Do not abandon the work of your hands. Father, we too are thankful this morning for your love that goes on forever and ever. We are thankful, Lord, that you too, like David, you protect us. When we are in the thickest darkness and danger. We are thankful Lord and will sing with praise to you for the great God you are and the great things you have done. I pray Lord this morning that as we worship you in song and as we hear you speak to us. As we uh, come here together. That, Lord, it would be more than uh, an appointment on our calendar. That it would be a time with each other and with you. Lord, I pray that even right now, this moment, if we've not already, I pray that we would take a moment to realize that we are in your presence. And take a moment to confess our sin so that we are clean before you. And take a moment to look to you with humility and with expectation that this morning you are going to do something great, something great here in our midst, something great in my heart and my life. Lord, we have come to meet you and we have come with gratitude, humility and expectation. And so Lord, as we come this way to you this morning, I pray that you would be pleased and I pray Lord that you would bless and I pray Jesus in your name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing Nothing But the Blood.
Come on, church. Let us pray. Father God in heaven, if we just sung the song, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. I pray, Father, that every person that's here today, they have asked that question, Father, for you, for Jesus, you come into our hearts. And I pray, Father, they accept you as their Lord and Savior. But, Father, we know that Jesus had to leave his disciples. He told them he was sitting in the council to help them. He was the Holy Spirit. I pray, Father, that the Holy Spirit that dwells in us, that he will lie, guide and direct us through each and every day, Father. Help us convict of ourselves of our sins, our mistakes, and our shortcomings, Father. I pray, Father, that you take up these tithes and offerings, Father, to glorify that kingdom, Father. I pray, Father, that those who do here today, as we go out through this week, that we show others that Jesus lives in our hearts, that we are filled with the Holy Spirit. Father, we pray now as Pastor Wayne comes to speak to us, to praise you high and high in Calvary Cross, that when I see him, Father, we see you as he brings us your word. Now, I pray, Father, we leave here with peace. I know, Father, that some here today have got a heavy burden on their heart. Only the peace that you can give them, Father. I pray, Father, they'll give it all to you and trust in you and have faith in you. Father, we give you the praise and we give you the glory. Ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
Father, I pray that our songs have been a sacrifice of praise to you, God. In them we have sung about our devotion to you and our walk with you. And we have sung about your love for us and the cross on which you died. And Father, we have sung these not just as an exercise or a, a trip down memory lane, but Lord, we have offered them to you as a sacrifice to uh, tell the truths and the emotions of our heart in song and given them to you. I pray that they have been pleasing. And now, Lord, I pray that you would speak to us and that as we hear you, Lord, uh, we would not ignore you. We would not say no to you. But, Lord, we would say yes as you lead us, and as you guide us to truth and to change. So I pray this, Lord, in your name. Amen. Today begins a time in the book of Romans. And before we even get to verse 1, I just have a simple question for you. What's your passion? That's maybe a new way to ask a question that we've always asked. Now, what in your life... Uh, drives you? What in your life gets you excited? What would you get up in the morning uh, to do? Uh, If you had a day that you could do anything you wanted, what would be the first thing that you would do? What is the the goal of your life? What are you striving for? Uh, These are things that you could ask the same question. What's at the core of who you are? No, I'm amazed at the things that people have passion for. Uh, Some things to me seem really insignificant, but people are passionate about it. Uh, To me, uh, collecting things seems very insignificant, but some people are very passionate about it. Now, I will admit I have collected things. When I was a child, I collected baseball cards. And when I was a little bit older, uh, Sarah and I, for whatever reason, had this idea to collect all of the state quarters that came out in the early 90s, if you remember that. And so we even had a book uh, that we put the quarter in, you know. And then we also wanted to make sure we didn't just get the, uh, the Philadelphia minted ones. You had to get the Denver minted ones, too. So we had two books, one for each of those quarters. And I don't even know where that thing is now. I think it's in the attic somewhere. 
I guess it's worth 50 times 25 cents is what it's worth. But again, to me, you know, as I look back, think of all the, the effort and the uh, passion that went in just to find those quarters. Now, if you're a collector and you're collecting whatever, I mean, people collect stamps, they collect uh, insects, you know, they collect all kinds of things. That's fine. But what I'm saying is if that's your passion, great. What other things are you passionate about? And we will see today what the Apostle Paul was passionate about. But first, a commercial. As we come to the book of Romans, there are resources that you have at your fingertips that will help you understand this book. If you go to our church app and you look at the bottom and it, see where it says watch and you press that, you can, of course, see all of our services. But also there is the Bible Project. And if you press that, it has an introduction video to all the books of the Bible. Of course, Romans is one of the books of the Bible. So you can watch that. Also, Right Now Media is a free streaming service that you all have access to because you are part of Olive Branch Baptist Church. I recommend two great series on the book of Romans. One is Bible Backroads, and this is sort of like almost like a uh, Indiana Jones type of guy who drives around in his Jeep, but what he does is he drives around to places in Rome and gives you a background to the book of Romans based on the actual places in Rome. So you can find that. Also, J.D. Greer has just finished a second part series to the book of Romans. And so there's other ones there as well. These are two that I recommend to you. Of course, again, as the slide is shown every week, if you want a free Right Now Media account, just text OBBC to 49775. That really does sound like a commercial, doesn't it? Of course, you can go to the website as well, and you can uh, get a free account there. You can go to the app and go to the discipleship uh, thing, and you can get a free account there as well. And there's lots of things to see on Right Now Media. And finally, again, if you go to our website and go to the discipleship page or on our app, if you look, there are different boxes, and one of them is discipleship, uh, you can also see a free course on the book of Romans from Dallas Seminary, but there's lots of free courses. And again, these aren't courses where you have to do homework and you have to turn in assignments. It's not that. You just watch, and it's a professor teaching you about the different books of the Bible and the different subjects. And so here's just some resources at your fingertips at our website or on the app. Back to Romans, okay? Where did Paul write the book of Romans? It was while he was ministering in Corinth. And he wrote this in the winter of 57 or the spring of 58. And as you see from this map, he was staying there on his third missionary journey in Corinth. And he was getting ready in his thoughts to go to Rome. What he was going to do was leave Corinth. He had collected an offering for the poor in Jerusalem from the churches that he had founded. And he was going to take that offering to Jerusalem, give it to the poor in the church at Jerusalem. And then it was his intent to go to Rome and visit the church there. If you read the book of Acts, when he got to Jerusalem, Paul was arrested and he was put into prison. And that's how the book of Acts ends, with Paul in prison and... The, actually, he's in Rome in prison. And then uh, the, uh, it's kind of hard from the, the New Testament to figure out exactly then what happened to Paul. Because we do read his letters that he wrote later uh, to Timothy and to Titus. And those seem as though he was released from prison. We do know that he was executed at the end of his life in Rome as a martyr. And so... Uh, we don't know how he was able to minister to the Romans as he wanted. We don't know whether he got to go from uh, his first imprisonment and go farther afield. That's not told us in the New Testament. But this was his intent, and you see this as you read, especially the end of the book of Romans, Paul's desire to see this, these Christians in this church that he did not found, which is unusual for his letters. 
most of the letters he wrote, except for the book of Colossians, and this one are to churches that he was there to start. And he's encouraging. But this is a letter of introduction to people that he has not met. And so this is the book of Romans. And so he writes it to introduce himself, not in the sense that they don't know who Paul is, <laughs> but uh, to say, you know, you've heard of me. Well, this is who I am. And I want to come to you. And he explains the gospel that he has been proclaiming through all of these three missionary journeys that he has taken. He wants them to know what his ministry is all about. He wants to, them to know that he has longed to be with them. And now it is his plan to come and see them. If you had to outline the book of Romans... It would be this way. We're going to look today at the greeting that Paul gives. But then you see that there is our sin problem. God's solution is justification by faith. Our sanctification through the Holy Spirit. Israel's place in God's plan. And then Paul teaches us how to live our Christian life. And then there's more information about Paul's plans. And a lot of greetings to people that he had heard of that were in Rome. And that is the book of Romans. We will spend a few weeks in it. It is, in some ways, the most significant letter of Paul's, the most important, and how it tells us so much about the gospel. Uh, some preachers will spend months in the book because there is so much there. We will not do that. And you're probably saying, thank you. <laughs> also, we will break it up some so that we're not in it for 16 straight weeks. Or if you spend more time in each chapter, 20 weeks or longer. So we will break it up with some special holidays and other Sundays and finally get to the end. But I am excited about this journey because this is the foundation of our faith. Uh, the gospel. The good news. Uh, this is the foundation. Of course, Jesus is the foundation, but the gospel is about Jesus, who he is and what he's done. And so our faith's foundation is right here in the book of Romans, and that's why it is so important. It is the first of Paul's letters after the book of Acts and how our New Testament is laid out, probably for two reasons. One it is the longest, and if you notice, the letters are not in chronological order that Paul wrote them, but in length of how long they are. But also, it is, in theological sense, the most important letter that Paul wrote. So let me ask you another question. I am God's... You fill in the blank. You know, there's lots of words that you could fill that blank in with. And they'd all be biblically correct. I'm sure there's other words you could use that wouldn't be biblically correct. But you could still use them. Uh, you could say, I am God's child. Which is true. The Bible talks about how when we are saved, we are adopted as children into God's family. You could say that I am God's branch. And that would be true too. Remember Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. You could say, I am God's bride. The Bible talks about how the church is the bride of Christ. The church is even called a building. You could say, I'm God's building. You could say, I'm God's friend. That's what Jesus said to his disciples. I call you friends. So there's lots of words you could use to fill in that blank, and they'd all be right. Which one came to your mind first as you think about your relationship to God? Maybe one of those that I used. Maybe a different one. I think it's significant whatever one came to mind first probably is how you think most about your relationship to God. And I can understand a very popular one is the idea that we are children of God. Because God is a father to us in the sense that he protects us. He provides for us. He leads us. So much like I am God's sheep would be the same thing. God is our shepherd because he protects us, he feeds us, he leads us. But Paul describes himself with a different word, which is also biblically correct. And his word was, 
I am God's servant. God's apostle and God's set apart one. These all kind of work together. And here's the verse that I'm referring to. Paul says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. A servant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. So Paul is a servant. We know what that word means. The idea really is similar to what we find in the Old Testament of someone who's not a slave in the sense that they have been kidnapped and they have been subjugated and that they are a slave. It's a voluntary submission. You see in the Old Testament the bond servant who is a servant and then has an opportunity to free himself. And he says, no, I want to remain with my master. And he becomes a servant for life. And that's the idea behind Paul's idea of a servant. He is the servant of Christ for his life. Christ is the master who is to be obeyed and he gives the direction and he gives the call and Paul does what he is told and follows where Christ leads him. And so the idea of apostle is, of course, very specific if you think of the 12, but the idea of being sent out is what the word means can apply to us as well. Because Paul's a servant, and part of being a servant is God has called him to go out. He was sent out to go, especially for him, to the Gentiles to tell them the good news of Jesus Christ. And that's what he said. He says, I've been set apart. This is my purpose in life. My purpose is to take this good news and to give it and relay it to the Gentiles so that they will believe. So yes, for Paul, this was a specific thing for his life in one way. He was a servant of God. He was called to be an apostle to the Gentiles. He was sent out for that purpose. But when you think about it, it's also true of us in a more general way as well. For we are ourselves to realize we are servants of God. I'll just give three examples here. Remember Jesus... His attitude when he came to earth was that of a servant. Paul reminds us this in Philippians chapter 2. And he tells us to have the same attitude that Christ had. That he did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped. But he emptied himself and became a man. And became obedient to death. Even death on a cross. And then the Father exalted him. So that at his name every knee will bow and tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We are to be a servant because that's what Jesus was. Jesus said, I did not come to be served, but to serve. Jesus washed the disciples' feet to show them that, they were, that he was a servant and they were to be a servant as well. He told them the greatest in the kingdom isn't the one who is served. It is the one who serves, the exact opposite of the worldly culture. You know, if an alien came to this planet and wanted to know who were the most prominent people in our culture, they could just see where all the servants are. <laughs> and all those servants are orbiting around someone who's important or has a lot of money or has a lot of power. But that's not true in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, the most important one is the servant who is serving. In Jesus' parable about service... Uh, the servants do the work that they are called to do. And Jesus says these servants, you know, when they think about this, if, if, if you were a servant and you had a job to do that day, I don't, whatever it is, you were to make the meals, you were to clean the house, you were to, to muck out the stables, you were to plant the corn, you were to harvest the corn, whatever it was. And you did that faithfully. And it's the end of the day, and you come in from the fields. 
Does the master then say, oh, wow, look at what you did. Here, here, let me give you this nice meal. And here, let me give you this nice big bedroom to take a, a sleep in. And here, let me... No, the, the master doesn't do that. The master just gave you the list for the next day. Okay, so uh, Jesus' point is that uh, when we are really, in one sense unworthy servants of anything that we get. It's anything we get, even as a reward for our service, is because God wants to. And it's out of His mercy and His grace. So we are servants. And we have been set apart to go and make disciples of all nations. And so like Paul, we are to serve others. Paul also loved others. Now I want you to think about this. The people in your life. I think it's harder for us as Christians, as we get older, to really want to have many more people in our life. Have you ever thought about that? When we have our family, and maybe it gets bigger when grandkids or great-grandkids are born, so you know that does get bigger. But we have our family... If we've lived in any area for a good length of time, we have our friends. If we're working, we have the people we know at work. If we're retired, we have our clubs and our groups. And so lots of times we're pretty content with that. And then we don't, as we should, look at all the people around us that are in desperate need of Jesus. We just don't really, I mean, we don't hate them. We just ignore them on purpose. We're just kind of content with who's in our life already. And that can be a danger because we're not called to be content with the group of friends we have. We are called to go and make disciples. And this is true, I think, of probably every Christian. Someone who's an unbeliever and becomes a Christian very soon after that, all their friends are Christians. And that's understandable. We love to be together. Uh, we have a common uh, faith. We have a common Heavenly Father. We have common values. We want to do the same type of things. But we're not called just to get into some kind of holy huddle and pat each other on the back and love on each other. We're commanded to go. And this is one of the hardest things for Christians to do is to make friends with unbelievers, uh, meet unbelievers, or talk to unbelievers that are already in your life about Jesus. Well, that was Paul's passion, and it should be ours as well. The verses in Romans chapter 1 say this. He says, first... I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because of the news of your faith is being reported in all the world. God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in telling the good news about his son. That I constantly mention you. Always asking in my prayers that if it is somehow in God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I want very much to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, to be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. Now, I don't want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I often planned to come to you, but was prevented until now, in order that I might have a fruitful ministry among you, just as I have had among the rest of the Gentiles." I am obligated both to Greeks and barbarians, both to the wise and the foolish. So I'm eager to preach the gospel to you, also who are in Rome. Do you hear Paul's eager to go and be with them? He's wanted to go before because he's heard about their faith. Paul didn't found the church of Rome. It was probably Jewish believers from the day of Pentecost who were from Rome, maybe were there in Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost, went back to Rome, started the church, and they were doing well, they were growing, and their faith had been heard about all over the empire. 
And Paul, because of that, had wanted to go. But to this time, he'd been pretty busy planting churches in a lot of the area uh, where Gentiles live, north of where uh, the <coughs> Jesus and Judea were, but you know, into parts that are modern-day Turkey and modern-day Greece. This is where Paul had been. But now it's his opportunity to go. But again, notice why he wants to go. He loves them and wants to go there, not to go visit Rome and see all the sights, not to do all the, the uh, sightseeing or go to the Colosseum and, and see some kind of event, not to eat all the good pasta there. You know, that's not why he wants to go to Rome. He wants to go there so that he can share the gospel with them. Which is interesting, isn't it? Because they're already Christians. <laughs> but he wants to go there so that he can share this gospel with them. He also wants to go there so he can encourage them and they can be encouraging him as well. So again, the gospel, probably he wants to share it with them to, to show them again, as he does in his letter, this is what my life's about. And this is the truth, the good news. You have believed it. Let's embrace it even more and let's go and tell others about it. And that's why he's excited and he's eager to go and to see them. And what he wants to share with them is this gospel. If I asked you this question, what is the gospel? You could come up with, again, several different answers that would all be biblically correct. Because probably the answer you gave might be true but not very deep. Or your answer could be deeper, but not at the deepest level. For example, what is the gospel? You could say the gospel is Jesus died on the cross for our sins and he rose again from the dead. And if you believe in him, you will be saved. Excellent answer. But think about it. Who's a sinner? What is sin? Why did Jesus have to die? For sin. Why did he have to raise from the dead? What does it mean to believe? What does eternal life mean? Do you see there's lots of questions that aren't answered in simply stating that fact? And so that's what the book of Romans is. Paul goes deeper to explain who is a sinner? What is sin? And why is that a problem? What has God done to fix that problem? How do we receive His grace? How, how do we receive salvation? What happens to us when we have it? What's our life like? How? So He answers these questions because, as I said, the gospel can be said simply. And it can be understood simply by even a child. And even a child can believe and be saved. But my goodness, there, there's libraries filled with books of Christians trying to understand better and more fully the depth of this wonderful gospel. And so in the book of Romans, we get the privilege from the Apostle Paul himself to dig deeper and to understand it. As you've heard many times, the word gospel is the good news. And so Paul says this, first in the first part and then at the end. He says, the gospel which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the holy scriptures concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, who was a descendant of David according to the flesh and was appointed to be the powerful son of God according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. Through him we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the Gentiles, including you who are also called by Jesus Christ. Later he says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. In these 17 verses, Paul uses the word gospel five times. 
He makes eight statements about it. And you're looking at your watch and saying, oh, no, here the pastor's going to go over eight statements, and it's already time for Sunday school. I'll go over them briefly, but that's what the rest of the book of Romans is about. So thankfully for our time and for your attention, we do not have to dig deeply into the eight. But it was promised. I love it how Paul writes it. The gospel wasn't just prophesied about in the Old Testament. It was a promise that's been fulfilled. And so the gospel is in the Old Testament. This isn't something new. And this was important for Paul who would at times, he would first go to a town and preach to the Jews and show them from the Old Testament scriptures that Jesus is the Messiah who was to die for sin and to be resurrected to life. This isn't new. It's a promise that was prophesied in the Old Testament through the prophets. That's what the gospel is. It's about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He was a descendant of David in the flesh, but he was the son of God in the spirit. And he has been powerfully resurrected from the dead. The gospel is about grace through Jesus Christ. Grace is a gift from God, but it's also for his name's sake. We've mentioned this before. Yes, salvation is about us because we're saved from hell and receive eternal life. But the whole plan of salvation is to bring glory to God more than it is to save our skin from fire. Also, the gospel is obedience that comes through faith. Faith in Christ brings salvation, which brings a new life, which brings obedience to God. It is a calling to belong to Jesus Christ, and it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. In the gospel, in this good news, is the power of God. The power of God to break the chains of sin, to bring forgiveness, to break the hold that Satan had on us and the destination that we were going to, a lake of fire. This gospel has the power to stop that. And to break that, it has the power to raise us from the dead. To have us in heaven with our Lord forever. It has the power to transform us in our lives right now. It's not just salvation that we look to in the future. The power of God is working in us right now. Changing us. From a sinner saved by grace into the very likeness of the Son of God, Jesus himself. This is the power of God in the gospel. So don't think of the gospel as simply some kind of fact that you believe or or a moment where you're giving a gift of eternal life. That is true, but it's far more than that. It is the, the power of God to change us and to change our destiny and to change this broken world and the people who are on it who believe in him. So this morning as I go to pray and as you go to respond, what is your passion? If you're passionate about coins and stamps, there's nothing wrong with that as long as you're also just as passionate about our God and serving Him and telling others and taking this deposit of the gospel that we've been in treasure with and sharing it with others. Where is your passion? Who are you sharing it with? How is the gospel powerfully changing you? Lord Jesus, thank you. Jesus, Change us. And Jesus, give us the heart of you. You gave up heaven to seek and to save the lost. You called Paul to go, to give up family, prestige, and wealth, and comfort. To take this gospel to those who were desperately lost. Lord, may we have that same passion to be your servant and to share the gospel 
with those who are desperately lost. Lord, help us to make our priorities right and our passions in line with you. And Lord, may we do so right now in this moment as we pray, as we sing, as we respond. And I pray, Jesus, in your name, amen. Let's stand and sing, but also let's respond. I'll be here to pray with you with any need or decision you want to make. will be dismissed. Lord Jesus, I pray that we are not ashamed of the gospel, that we are not ashamed of, of relating to you and loving you, that we are uh, changed by the power of, of your gospel and of your strength and might. We thank you for all that you have done, Lord Jesus, and it's in your name that we pray. Amen.